A new global inquiry showing people's uh, beliefs and values was recently published. Question number 42 in that inquiry was, how important is religion? And people who tick the box, religion is very important in my life. The statistics is like this. In many countries, you will find extremely high figures. Senegal, 98%, Indonesia, 95 Brazil, 78 India, 74 Go to, over to the US, it's lower, but it's still the majority, 57% thinks religion is very important in my life. If you move over to Europe, the picture drastically changes. The highest figures are in Poland, 33%. Germany, 25%, Britain, 19%, Hungary, 15%, and in my country, 8%. Now, it's a world of difference. If 98% of the population thinks religion is very important, or 8% thinks religion is very important. In the latter case, religion generally, and Christianity specifically, is seen as having nothing to do with truth and reality any longer. And it creates a strong attitude of dismissal and cynicism. So people can say like this about theology and talk about God. Theology is searching in a dark cellar at midnight for a black cat that isn't there. Now some people then say, well, this is enlightenment, the modern thinking. What about postmodern thinking and culture? Haven't we passed the modern enlightenment area and moved beyond it to the postmodern area where people don't believe in truth any longer? And that could open some, some doors for us. Many think that the change from modern to postmodern thinking will somehow solve our problem and open the door for the gospel again. And they think that Christian ap apologetics has been made obsolete since people do not care about truth. I think this is wrong. First, even though postmodern thinking is influential in some areas, Western culture in gener generally is far from postmodern. Let me take, give you some example. Uh, <clears throat> take science as one example. It operates on the general assumption that there is an external reality about which we can have true knowledge. This reality is the same for everybody around the globe. The debate on global warming is a current example. It presupposes from all sides that there are universal truths. Or take ethics and the discussion about homosexuality. The new view on homosexuality, that it should be affirmed and embraced, which is now the dominant view in my country, is not seen as rel uh, relative or context-dependent. It is seen as the right view that should be exported to other cultures, and others should be convinced about it. Or take the debate about religion and the new atheists who are making absolute claims about religion. Now, I'm not denying the influence of postmodern thinking. It affects the way many people think and react. What I am denying is that the modern perspective has been replaced by the postmodern. It has not. Along similar lines, we need to think right about postmodern spirituality. The postmodern is born out of the modern, which is naturalistic, and that naturalism has never been challenged. In postmodern spirituality, therefore, there is no real transcendence, only immanence, only pantheism and mysticism. There is no real God outside the human experience. Even though words like God or prayers are used, they're used within a different framework, a different worldview, without a real transcendence. As Christians living in a secular culture, we now therefore have a double challenge. The concept of truth is challenged from the postmodern philosophers, and the content of truth is challenged by uh, the Enlightenment perspective. The lesson to learn is this. Don't underestimate the enemy. Secularism and secularity goes hand in hand with both the modern and the postmodern perspective, and can even affirm a dose of spirituality 
as long as it is grounded in man only. At the same time, it has devastating hole in his armor. The project of liberating man from God simultaneously undermines man. Without God, the significance and worth of the individual is evaporating. Our aspirations and longing ends in nothing, and human existence in the final analysis is without meaning. At the Manila, at, uh, in the Manila Manifesto, we can read this. We also affirm that the apologetics, namely the defense and confirmation of the gospel, is integral to the biblical understanding and mission and essential for effective witness in the modern world. Paul reasoned with people out of scriptures with a view to persuading them of the truth of the gospel. So must we. In fact, all Christians should be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. I will end by just referring to what could be called the world's first Christian sermon in Acts 2. In Acts chapter, chapter 2, Peter is, uh, the context of Peter's sermon is a context of bewilderment, amazement, perplexity, and even ridicule in relationship to what God is doing in, to this new community in Jerusalem. And Peter had to respond to two different questions, where the first question is, what does this mean? The things that is happening in Jerusalem and the things that the first Christian believed, what does it mean? And you can find five very different aspects in Peter's respond to that question. Later on, he had to an answer the question, what shall we do? Peter presents the gospel, firstly, as reasonable. It's reasonable truth. He begins by saying, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. So he has a message that can be explained in words and rationally understood. He invites them to listen carefully and thereby asking them to analyze and probe his message. It's public truth. Peter refers to and underlines that it is about a shared reality and he appeals to the knowledge of his hearers. He points to their knowledge three times. He says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. It was public truth. Thirdly, it was historical truth. The gospel is good news about what has happened in history. And this has been, there's witnessed to that. Up to 600 people who saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. Fourthly, the message is a biblical truth. Peter quotes Joel once and David twice. There is coherence in the unfolding of God's revelation in the Old and the New Testament. And finally, the gospel is convincing. Peter says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And thousands of people came to faith. We may have somewhat different situations than Peter had in Jerusalem, but I think we should share his attitude of presenting a reasonable, public, historical, biblical, and convincing truth. Therefore, we have an urgent need to upgrade apologetics and reaffirm its importance. We need to equip Christians so they can stand firm in the faith, and we need to challenge the growing impact of secularism and secularity with the wonderful truth and wonderful life of the gospel.